How did this bright girl from a good home become one of Britain's most notorious and cold-blooded serial killers? Over two weeks in 2013, Joanne Dennehy went on a killing spree, murdering three men and attempting to kill two others. She stabbed him 20 times, 30 times. With exclusive access to police evidence, I will examine her brazen behavior minutes after she was arrested. This is just moments after she has tried to kill two innocent men. To find out the truth about her past, I will talk to her old friends who have never spoken before. She'd be like, oh, you'd be better off dead. You know, I can help you if you want, and you should just kill yourself. Including those who were closest of all to her. I slept with that woman in the same bed. I lived in the same house as her. I've had two children with her. I want to find out what made Joanne Dennehy target men to manipulate and murder. It was like she was a drug. It was like they couldn't say no to her. I think she did have a magnetic pull. I can see why men might feel drawn to her. She is one of only three British women ever to be sentenced to spend the rest of her life behind bars. But she has a unique status even among them. She is the most dangerous woman in the British prison system. One of Britain's biggest and bloodiest murder investigations began with a simple missing persons inquiry. In March 2013, 48-year-old father of two, Kevin Lee, went missing in Peterborough. I have come to meet the senior detective who took up the case. You must get calls about missing people regularly. What was different this time? Having read the circumstances, it just, it felt wrong. It was just a gut feeling. This was way more than somebody who didn't come home for tea. Martin Brunning's suspicions were confirmed when Kevin Lee's car was found burnt out in the Peterborough countryside. Then, in the early hours of the next morning, a chance discovery changed the course of the investigation. Well, he was just walking up the road and he went into the field and had a sniff. And then he came back up, but then he came back again, which he doesn't normally do that. And that's when I came down to see what he was sniffing at. And uh, I saw this uh, body that's under this bridge just here for this tire is. I called the police and they told me to stand the other side of the road and wait for him. The body was identified as that of Kevin Lee. He had been stabbed through the heart and dumped in a remote ditch. Looking around me in a field in the middle of nowhere and the usual thought process is, how are we going to solve it? Where's the line of inquiry going to come from? There was one major clue in the way Kevin Lee's body had been found. He was face down and naked from the waist. On his top half was a black sequin dress first thing that came into my head was, this guy's been humiliated, he's been put in this position. That was the challenge around understanding why this one was different, and it was very, very different. The way the body had been posed had all the hallmarks of a deeply disturbed killer at work. Jeremy Coyd is an expert on the minds of psychopaths. Well, his body was placed in that way to degrade him and get excitement and pleasure from the humiliation of him, even after he was dead. This is a picture of Kevin with my son mm. when he was a baby. He's got a kind face, hasn't he? Yes, mm. yes, he was very kind mm. and a um, very loved man as well. Kevin Lee's family were kept closely informed of the ongoing investigation. When you knew that a body had been found, your hearts must have stopped. You think, please don't let it be him, but if he's missing and a body's been found and his car's burnt out, in your heart, 
just nails him. Yeah. You're struggling with the fact that he's yeah. dead and the fact that he's been found in a ditch. Yeah. But he was found in a, yeah. a particular way, wasn't he? I just... That just, like, was just the weirdest, most upsetting. The... Kevin left like that? It's not Kevin. It was, um, hard to take in, you know, that you, your loved one being found in that way. Kevin didn't wear, you know, dresses. And I just kept thinking, who the hell could do such a thing, you know? Police had only one lead. It was likely whoever murdered Kevin Lee knew him. I suspected that somebody had some reason in Kevin's life to do this to him, which begged the question, what's Kevin into? Who's he upset? Who does he associate with? Police looked into Kevin Lee's life. A husband and father of two, he was also a local landlord. Just hours into the investigation, mobile phone data came back, which placed one of his tenants near his burning car. A 30-year-old called Joanne Dennehy. I never anticipated that it was going to be a woman that had done this. The humiliation aspect and the way that the body had been positioned couldn't reconcile in my mind seeing physically a woman in that ditch doing that to a man. But phone data also tracked another person to the scene. At seven foot three, and with a string of burglary convictions, the presence of Gary Stretch seemed to answer some questions. OK, so we've got this giant of a man at seven foot three who's more than capable of humping the dead weight of a man into a ditch and creating the sort of theatre that I'd seen. Now we're starting to get some clarity, but Where's Joanne Dennehy's involvement in all of this? Is it all Gary Stretch? Both Dennehy and Stretch were missing. Police considered them extremely dangerous. Given what I had seen and the violent nature in which Kevin Lee died, I was really concerned about the risk to the public. They needed to be caught quickly. Police launched a nationwide appeal Joanne Dennehy and Gary Stretch were now on the run. In 24 hours, they made it as far as Hereford and the flat of an old contact. They seemed unfazed and posed for a series of bizarre photographs, including this now infamous picture. But they had no money, only some stolen goods. So Gary reached out to someone in the area who he thought could help sell them on. I've had a bit of a weird text. And he said to me, look, Mark, I've got some stuff for you. Do you want to come down to my place? I bite down her, knocked on the door, and then this woman with a star tattoo. She's opened the door. As soon as I walked in, and Joanne's gone right in front of me, pulled a knife out of her bra, and said, you know Gary, he's the taxi driver, he dumps the bodies. I go around killing people. It was not the situation Mark was expecting, but he played along out of fear for his life. I was terrified. I had to convince her that I was on her side because I think she would have killed me without, without hesitation. Despite Stretch's size, it was Dennehy that Mark was afraid of. She was the one in control. Gary was like a dog without a bark, without a bite. She was a Rottweiler and he used a poodle. Mark convinced Dennehy and Stretch he had a contact in Hereford who would buy their stolen goods. And the three of them got in the car. Next final minute, it was like, she kept telling me about where the bodies were. She kept going on about, I want my phone, I want my phone, Gary. And I'm thinking, oh, what's she going on about? And then Gary turned around and said, look, Mark, just let her talk. And then the closer we get to Hereford, we got a fag, Mark. I said, look, I'm going to need cigarettes. And she goes, well, can you take me to the shops? I thought I was in the shop on my own, and then I just got a sense that she was behind me. And then she's, like, grabbed me around the chest. She's got the handle of the blade in me, so back in the kidneys and said, just get the cigarettes, Mark, and I think, oh, great. She was in control then. And then she's having some flirtatious banter with the shop assistant. See, when she's doing that, but she's actually saying to her, you've got, you've got a nice bum or something like that. I've tried staying behind, but Joe's doing that. This is literally 
a minute before the first attack. Meanwhile, police were closing in on Dennehy and Stretch. I got a telephone call to say that a Norfolk detective was looking at some CCTV that related to a car driving onto a petrol station forecourt. A woman gets out, fills a basket of groceries, darts out the shop, jumps in the car, the car speeds off. And straight away, we fire that index number into our intelligence databases, and we can see the vehicle traveling southwest along the M5. So the next couple of hours are pacing around, waiting for that phone call to come back to say we've got them. But Joanne Dennehy was on a mission. She had two men under her control in the car and was now hunting for more men to murder. Left the shop, and then at the blue she goes, why you need to find me one? I thought she was talking to me first of all. I said, what are you want about? And the guy goes, oh, no, Mark, she's doing her thing. I thought, what? So this bloke walking with his black Labrador. Gary's gone, will he do? And Joe's gone, yep. And the second she said that, Gary's slammed on the brakes. He's got out. She's just gone. I think struck him in the arm, first of all. Stabbed him 20 times, 30 times. He's just walking his dog, for God's sake. The look of shock and surprise on his face for him. Yeah, I'll take that to him away, though. Me and Gary are having a humongous argument. I was trying to get out the door. He's then turned around, gripped me like that. He said, Mark, there's nothing you can do. You have to let her do her thing. She's now walking back towards me, very calm, very connected. Life's still in her hand. We're driving down the road. Then she said to Gary, um, don't want to do any women, don't want to do any kids. I need, you need to find me a man with a dog. You need to find me a man with a dog. He's pulled over, he's looked for the windscreen and said, what will he do? I know what's going to happen. But this one was um, 20 times worse than the first one. And she was all, at, all over him like a blank. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. And then she grabbed the dog and next minute she sat in the front, front of the seat and said, I've got a new dog. Yeah. And the bloke was trying to crawl around the corner. Yeah, and it was bloody for her. I thought, gosh, she's killed two people. And then she just got back in the car and Gary went, let's get a Tesco. Joanne Dennehy was on a killing spree on the streets of Hereford. She had stabbed two random dog walkers and left them both for dead. Driving her around was her accomplice, Gary Stretch, and in the back of their car, an unwilling passenger, Mark Lloyd. I've seen violence all my life, but not like that. It was just unprovoked, done. What well, he's only walking his dog. After the second attack, Joanne Dennehy stole the dog of her victim and took it into the car with her. I was looking through the windscreen, I could see all his insides beginning to fall out. He left a trail of blood everywhere, and I'm thinking, there's a bloke dying on the, on the, on the driveway, and, and you're more interested in about the, taking the dog for a walk. The police had been agonizingly close to both attacks. Now, they finally closed in, arresting Joanne Dennehy in the car with her new dog on her lap. The police had turned up. I've had about 20 guns pointed at me. The last thing I remember was watching Joe and then he being put in the back of a van. I'm thinking, what, well, thank God for that. Gary Stretch made a run for it, but was caught later by police. We get the phone call, but we get told that there are two people expected to die who have just been attacked by Joanne Dennehy and she's been arrested with the knife. So this is a nightmare unfolding. I can't tell you what that feels like to get a phone call like that when you know that you were so close to getting where you wanted to be and you then start to hear about the carnage and you, 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 you can't describe it in any other way it was carnage afternoon afternoon uh, you've been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder and murder okay minutes after attacking two men joanne dennehy was in custody still more concerned about the dog. Yes. 
so the dog will be eating the cat. Exactly. Right? But at this stage, only she knew the scale of her murderous journey over the past two weeks. The next day, a call came in to major crimes. I picked it up, and it was the force control room. They said to me, are you aware of the body in the ditch at Thorny Dyke? As I put the phone down, it rang again almost immediately. It was the force control room again saying, you know, there's body in the ditch. There's two bodies in the ditch. I remember looking out at, at the team, and everybody was looking back at me, thinking, crikey, where's this going? What's happening? Did you go to the ditch? Yes. And what did you see? A horrific crime scene. Seeing two dead bodies side by side is something that I'd never seen before. Ten miles from where Kevin Lee had been found three days earlier, two more men had been dumped in a ditch, both stabbed through the heart. The first new victim was identified as Royal Navy veteran John Chapman, who had been sharing a house with Joanne Dennehy. When police searched the property, they found a blood-soaked mattress in the back garden. The other was 31-year-old Lukasz Slabajewski. His last recorded movements show him going to a cash point and then onto a flat to meet Dennehy. They had been sending each other suggestive text messages. Forensics would show that while Kevin Lee's body was the first to be found, Lukasz was in fact the first man that Joanne Dennehy killed. I think the first killing was a test for her. She's then probably realized, wow, I've done that. I haven't puked up, I haven't panicked, I haven't ran away, I liked it. Dennehy didn't seem to know what to do with Lukasz's body. At first, she kept it in a wheelie bin. She showed it to a 14-year-old girl and took pictures to show others her achievement. She took great delight in showing me the photo of the bloke in the bin. Yeah, I even put him in a bin mark. I could see his head sticking out the top of the wheelie bin, especially when, when the lid was lifted open. It's like a kid bringing out homework. You know, look what I've done today, Mum. Uh, yeah, well, you know, some people make pictures, you know, you just went and killed three people. Police now knew they were dealing with a female serial killer. While the two men on the streets of Hereford miraculously survived, Joanne Dennehy could now be linked to three bodies. Yeah, she's made it, hasn't she? She's made it. She wants to be famous. She wants to be a terrifying serial killer. After her capture, Joanne Dennehy would be diagnosed with a psychopathic disorder, characterized by superficial charm, a callous disregard for others, pathological lying, and a diminished capacity for remorse. But where did this behavior come from? Why did she target men? And what turned Joanne Dennehy into a monster? I am going back to her past to try and find the truth behind her transformation. Joanne Dennehy grew up here in the picturesque village of Redbourne in suburban Hertfordshire. She came from a decent, stable home and went to a good school in nearby Harpenden. Joanne was close to her younger sister Maria, who would go on to a career in the armed forces. Their mother Cathy worked in the local shop and their father Kevin was a security guard. In a letter to us, her family describe her as a smart and pretty child and say that in her early teens, butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. But away from home, what was young Joanne really like? Her school friends have never spoken about her before. She was a free spirit. She just didn't give a shit. She stood up for herself, she was bolshy. In that respect, we were quite similar. Vicky Greenwood was Joanne Dennehy's best friend for a while at secondary school. They would walk home from school together and hang out in their local village. So, Vicky, what did you used to get up to down here? A lot of mischief, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Swing on the swings, have a little sing-song. We used to be quite naughty and smoke here down here and hide from the parents. Mm. <laughs> Just but smoking? Smoking, we'd have a drink sometimes. Joanne, I'd definitely like to drink, that was for sure. 
So we would sneak drinks into school sometimes. How old was she then? She must have been about 14 then. Even at 14, a darker side of Joanne Dennehy was beginning to emerge. She'd get the geeky boys to do things for her and whether it be uh, making them do her homework or something, do you know what I mean? Mm. If they didn't do it, she was very open with giving someone a slap. She was manipulative. Very. She knew exactly what to get and how to get it. She'd make you feel like you're a sister from another mister. Um, you know, she'd look after you. Make you feel special? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. And then if you didn't conform to what she wanted, that's when things turned. Teenage Joanne Dennehy was developing traits which would emerge in far more sinister ways years later. She would charm people with her charisma, welcome them into her group, and then viciously turn on them. This class of 98 yearbook, does it bring back memories as you look at it? It's all signed from various people that I went to school with. What does it say up here? Uh, if some photos are not signed, the person was either expelled, ran away, and then I've written Joe Dennehy, or was ill. That was maybe my way of just pointing out the fact that she wasn't a very good person at that point in her life. Marika was a close school friend of Joanne Dennehy until the bullying began. What did Jo do? She might say, um, when you leave school, I'm gonna wait for you in this place, and then you're gonna get what's coming to you. You lived at school with the constant threat and fear that she might actually follow through. Yeah, on my way home, I was always fearful about going home. I might walk, like if she said that she'd be waiting for me somewhere, then I'd make sure I just went in a, even if it took me longer, a different way to walk home from school just so I didn't have to go past that place. Mm. It was always that thought of if I walk down that road or this road, that she might be there, and I don't know what she might do. Did she get a pleasure out of bullying? I think she enjoyed the way it made other people feel. People telling you to, you know, go and kill yourself, like, we don't want you around, and, you know, saying things like that. When they say it enough, you almost start to believe it. Did she tell you to go and kill yourself? Yeah, more, more than one occasion, she'd be like, oh, you'd be better off dead, or, you know, I can help you if you want, and you should just go and kill yourself. There were times when I was at school that when the bullying was really bad, that I could have quite easily just taken my life. Do you think she knew that you were upset? Yeah, I think it was fun for her. But when did Joanne Dennehy's bullying behaviour become more extreme? We have spoken to the Dennehy family. They didn't want to appear on camera, but they did write us a new account of Joanne's childhood. They say that in her early years, she was a bookworm and a girly girl. For them, the biggest change came around the time she met John Trina. When they say she began to try things she knew weren't tolerated at home. At the age of 15, Joanne Dennehy ran away from home and into the arms of a man six years older than her. John Trina would be her partner for the next 10 years. I wanted to meet this man, to learn about his life with Dennehy and find out if he accepts any responsibility for the path she ultimately chose. I have come back to where Joanne Dennehy grew up to try and make sense of her transformation from promising young girl to cold-blooded killer. It has led me to John Trina, the older man she met in her early teens. So you met, you're 21, she's 15. Obviously, that's a big age gap, mm -hmm. and she's under 16. Mm -hmm. Let's right. get to the heart of this. Yeah, you can. Go for it. Those close to her, mm -hmm might think that that's part of her decline. What's your response to I that? I think that's a load of crap. I think that I, I made my intentions straight away. There was no hiding the fact that I was going out of her. There was no um, lies. There was, I was straight there to her mum, honest, 
about who I was and what my intentions are, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know what I did was the right thing and how I treated her and loved her was the right thing. It's an obvious question to ask because she was 15, but, of mm. course, the age of consent is 16. Exactly, yes. I knew the law. I knew what would happen if I'd done anything wrong, and it never happened. So there was no sexual relationship no, no, before no, she was 16? No, no, no. I'm 100% sure, mm. 100% that I was above board. Did she run away from home, run away from school to be with you? No, she, okay. the, the, this is the other thing. In the papers, it says she left home at 14. But absolutely, 100%, she didn't leave home at 14. She left home at 15. Mm. She had come to mine saying she had a big argument with her mum. Um, she doesn't want to be there anymore and she's leaving. And we slept in a garage that night. Mm. So that's why we were homeless. We were living in a tent in a forest, in garages, at train stations. Then it went into a shared house. For Jo, she loved that life. For me, I, I hated it. She became pregnant at 17. Mm -hmm. Was that something you discussed? Had you planned to have a baby? I don't recall having a conversation about having a baby. It just happened. And was she happy to be pregnant for the first time? Oh, for both the pregnancies, she didn't drink, smoke or anything. She nurtured them in the right way, but the moment the baby was born, it all changed. When you see these photographs of Joe... She's stoned there. So she's holding her baby, mm -hmm. who is... She's just come out of hospital, and the first thought of her mind is to get... Look at her face. Was she loving towards No, them? no. I, you know, I, they're the bits that, you know, it's offish, arm's length, and she's not very affectionate. She was more about the the tough play fighting, mm -hmm. throwing them, taking them. You know, what's really strange about all of this is she used to take my... Um, eldest daughter down, you know, where she put these men in the dikes because we lived pretty much near those and she used to take them down there in the fields, throw in the dikes where the water was and it was all tough wrestling and throwing stones at cars and just gen not, not the instinct, you know, mothers have. What are the changes that you saw? Did her drinking get heavier? Yeah, I, I, at the worst, I was watching her drink two two-litre bottles of vodka, and she'd still be walking around. Did she take drugs? The first time she cheated on me, she come home six o'clock in the morning and basically told me exactly how it went and that she'd snorted cocaine that night whilst doing what she was doing at the kitchen sink. That's what she was about. You see this sort of pattern. You're attempting to make a relationship actually makes it worse. They're just not able to do it. So she can't cope with emotional closeness. She can't cope with children. She numbs herself with alcohol. So many of the things that we see later develop after that point. Five years into their relationship, John left Joanne Dennehy. In the year they were apart, Dennehy went back to her hometown and paid a visit to her old friends. I was walking down the lane to go to my house in Redbourne and she just appeared out of nowhere and she came straight up to me with a Stella bottle and smashed it right on the ground in front of me. And I was like, well, you're fucking lucky, Greenwood. She goes, I was going to put a firebomb through your letterbox today. I come to your door. And I mean, that shit me up. Joanne Dennehy was becoming increasingly violent. But John Trina took her back, and their second child was born. Then her behaviour became even more extreme. She's come round with pins in her arms, you know, needles that are actually sticking, gone been pierced through, and sort of like that, and out the other side, and they're all over her arms, and she's come in and she's just shut the door behind us and just put her back against it and sat on the floor, put her leg, you know, she had a short skirt on with long boots, and pulled out the knife and went in the floor and just said I could kill someone. The next day, it's, I'm not being here no more. John Trina moved out with their children, and with them went Joanne Dennehy's last chance of a stable life. She left the area in search of new excitement. Everything that was bad in life seemed to be the magnet 
She was happier when she was in a place that, for most people, would be the place they just want to get away from. Dennehy rented a room on this estate, on the outskirts of Peterborough. It's taken me a lot to come back here. It's the first time, last time I saw it, it was where the door was boarded up and it, everyone was here, the forensics. Michelle Bowles was Joanne Dennehy's neighbour. She remembers both Dennehy and her fellow tenant, Royal Navy veteran John Chapman, who would become one of her victims. This is a close community area, but we're well knitted. We were, you had me living in the end house there. You had Joe and John living there. That's Joe's bedroom up there. I believe it was quite girlified. Got perfumes, photos, everything matching. Do you go? We wouldn't expect that from her. And it was a really nice room. John Chapman was well liked on the estate and kept himself to himself until Joanne Dennehy arrived. John used to come into the house and say things like, oh, there's a crazy woman moving in. And we say to him, do you want us to have a word with her? With her? And he was saying, no, leave it. Most of the time she wasn't there, but when she was there, you knew about it, that she was there. You know what I mean? You was, too, you was like, oh, I'll keep my mouth shut now. It was only after Dennehy's arrest for murder that police discovered a possible motive for intimidating John Chapman. It came down to a link between Joanne Dennehy and their joint landlord, Kevin Lee. He was using her to basically intimidate people um, to pay their rent. Carla White lived in a nearby flat, also owned by Kevin Lee. One guy, he uh, was only young, and she um, punched him, knocked him clean out. Bless him, and he literally packed his bags and moved out the next day. She was going round and basically was being a nasty piece of work. By this stage, Dennehy was known to police. She had spent time in jail and had convictions for theft, drugs, possession of a blade, assault, and owning a dangerous dog. Carla White vividly remembers their first meeting. I walked in to the house. Kevin was there, and he was like, this is Joe. I was like, oh, hello, I'm Carla, pleased to meet you. She went, I don't give a fuck who you are, and put her hands around my throat. I then pulled a hammer out of my bag and um, tapped it against her cheek. And I just said, my darling, I said, I'm a girl that's got nothing to lose. If you put me down, you best make sure I don't get back up. And if I get back up, you better run. And then she just slowly, very slowly, just took her hands from my throat like that and just walked away. I'm getting a clearer picture of the person Joanne Dennehy had become in the build-up to her murders. She'd chosen a world of chaos and a dangerous lifestyle of drugs, violence and increasingly extreme sexual behaviour. I've spoken to one guy that said he woke up and she was carving him in his back um, because she wanted to know what it was like. I had another guy that said that he had to punch her while I was having sex, and she kept saying, harder, 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 harder. I did warn Kevin. Look, I don't know what is going on between you and this girl, mate. But um, I said, well, my exact words were to him were, you're playing with fire and you're going to get burnt. Police went on to discover evidence that suggested an even closer connection between Joanne Dennehy and Kevin Lee. When you hear the reports or the stories of the allegations that they were in a more intimate relationship, do you just not believe that? Because you can't believe that of Kevin. Um, I think even if it was like that, I think he was probably being coerced, exploited, probably frightened himself, you know. That was now Kevin. He was coerced by a monster. Joanne Dennehy did have a bizarre relationship with men. She targeted and killed them. She used them to help her commit her crimes. But crucially, she knew how to charm them. We can see this behavior for ourselves just minutes after she has stabbed two random men on the street. Thank you are Joanne Christina Dennehy. Joanne, have you been in custody before, Joanne? Yes. Despite the seriousness of the situation, Joanne Dennehy sets the mood and homes in on the male police officers. I love your eyebrows. Thanks. She's laughing, she's joking. She could even be called flirting. 
She's utterly shameless. She's extremely seductive. She has a whole series of tricks. There are some things that you might see in a prostitute in a bar who will use the similar type of behavior. She's flirting with the police officer. He's slightly embarrassed by her. He looks down, she gives him an extra long stare, she's complimented him. She runs her hands through her hair. She's reeling him in. This is amazing. Looks good. Thanks, Matt. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Real sexy. Her behaviour throughout this encounter is fascinating, and the police have given me access to the entire footage, which has never been shown in full. We've had a really hectic week. It allows our clearest glimpse into the mind of a psychopath at the height of her crimes. So something completely racist, offensive and inappropriate. She thinks it's a, all a big joke at the moment. Would you be cheering if you got for attempted murder and murder? I wouldn't, but... No, but I was just smiling. She has seen everything that other people have described. So Mark Lloyd described the shock and awe of seeing two people he thought had been murdered in front of him. Mm. She saw it and she did it, and yet you would have no indication from that footage that she's done anything other than steal a bottle of Jack Daniels. Mm. Right, how much have you had to drink today? Um, half a bottle of whiskey is mine. Expensive, sir. This callous performance, so soon after inflicting life-threatening injuries on random people, is evidence of her psychopathic behavior. She's buzzing, isn't she? This is primarily this sort of euphoria and the buzz, which is continuing as a result of what she's done. It's not murder, murder, it's not me. So going down to Sunny Rose? At this point, Joanne Dennehy has killed three men and thinks she may have killed two more. She's really big time now in her mind. She's not a gas meter bandit or a shoplifter. She's a killer. She doesn't care about anything. She's a real big criminal star. After Joanne Dennehy's show-stopping performance at the Hereford custody desk, Detectives were looking forward to getting her into the interview room. But as I am learning, psychopaths are unpredictable and like to remain in control. Joanne, can you please state your full name and your date of birth? Joanne Christina Dennehy, 29th of the 8th, 1982. Tell me about Joanne Dennehy's police interview. What you hoped you would get out of it. I fully expected her to sit there and almost want to tell us the story. She was now in a situation where she can do one of two things. She can gift us the gaps and tell us everything, or she can sit on the sidelines and watch us work for it. Did you murder Mishkash Slavajewski? She's got nothing to say in all of the interviews. She gives no explanation. She gives us nothing to work with. Did you murder Kevin Lee? Her behavior was quite different from the custody office. So that elated, happy-go-lucky almost, I'm not taking this seriously, I'll have a laugh and a joke with you personality was quite different. Did you murder John Chapman? Despite her silence, police had enough to charge Dennehy and she was sent back to custody. Behind the closed doors of her cell, the real Joanne Dennehy re-emerged. My first meeting with Miss Dennehy came completely out of the blue. My clerk said to me, there's a lady who's in Cambridge Magistrates Court. She's being charged with three uh, murders and two attempted murders. Most of the time, people who are charged with murder, they're nervous about the situation they're in. She wasn't like that, and that's, that's what makes her unusual. 
She was cooperative. She had a sense of humor, charismatic. Joanne Dennehy's behavior with men is hugely significant. They often find her charming, and even trained professionals can feel the pull of her personality. If you met this lady in a bar or a social situation, you would think she had a personality that you were quite drawn to. Well, that was my reaction. It was so unusual uh, that I initially wondered whether I'd actually gone into the cell with the right client. Dennehy's legal team prepared her case, and the police submitted their evidence. Martin Brunning hoped that the full story of why she had killed would finally emerge at trial. What did you anticipate she would do? I anticipated a trial, a long trial, and the whole story laid out to be seen and heard by the public and the families. The first day in court was going to be a formality. After her no comment strategy in police interviews, everyone expected Joanne Dennehy to plead not guilty and contest the charges at trial. What did the judge say, first of all? Do you remember? He asked, how do you plead? And she, she shouted, guilty, 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 guilty. She just kept reeling off these guilties. Even Joanne Dennehy's legal team was shocked at her decision to plead guilty at the very last minute. Her counsel looked to his right towards her with as much as to say, what on earth are you doing? When she entered her guilty pleas, Mr Lickley QC said in open court, um, my lord, those pleas were not as anticipated. It was almost like she didn't even pause. It was like, guilty, guilty. It was borderline fast because people were looking at each other as much as to say, what on earth is happening here? Joanne Dennehy was taking her last chance to be centre stage. I think she saw that opportunity to plead guilty completely against the knowledge, expectation or advice of her counsel. And she knew that it was the last chance to shock and awe and she shocked and awed. It was a piece of dramatic theatre. It was completely theatre. All I can say about Miss Dennehy is that she was going to do what she wanted to do. She was always in control. Gary Stretch's case went to trial. He was found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 19 years. Mark Lloyd was told he had no case to answer. Joanne Dennehy became one of only three British women after Rosemary West and Myra Hindley ever to be told she would spend the rest of her life behind bars. She's currently serving her sentence at Bronzefield Prison, where she's plotted violent escape attempts and reportedly threatened other inmates. She is the most dangerous woman that I've ever met and the most dangerous woman in the British prison system. While I can't show them due to legal reasons, I have seen letters she's written to multiple men outside prison, winning them over with intimate details of her life and teasing clues about her crimes. It seems Joanne Dennehy may never stop manipulating men. There is something deep in her psyche that does indicate a deep hatred towards men. Men I have spoken to who have met Dennehy talk of a similar experience when in her company. I, I, I hesitate to say this, you know, it's difficult, but um, I think she did have a, a, a magnetic pull. And I, I suppose I can see why men might feel drawn to her. They said it was like, it was like she, she drugged them, even though she hadn't, but that's what it was like. It was like she was a drug. It was like they couldn't say no to her. That's a glimpse of the psychopathic behavior that she's used at times in the build-up to her crimes. She would flirt with men to get men to do what she wanted. She drew people in. She did. But then when she turned. When she was finished, she put her rubbish in the bin. For some close to her, a lifetime in prison isn't punishment enough. Being sat in prison for the rest of your life is not really serving a sentence in this country. Mm -hmm. What are them families going to get from her lording it up in prison? Do you support the death penalty? 
I think some things do require that, yeah, absolutely. Would you support the death penalty for Joe? Yes, yeah. Which would mean seeing the mother of your two children, the two people you love most in the world, being put to death. OK, she is not my child's mother. As She gave birth to them. That's, that's all she is. She's the donor. She gave them over. You know, I don't really want my kids to have anything to do with this woman. No one can say exactly what turned that sweet young girl into a tearaway teen and then, ultimately, a twisted killer. But what is clear to me is that so many people still have to live with the legacy of what she did, from her friends of 20 years ago to the families of the men she brutally murdered. What are your lasting memories of Kevin? We just absolutely miss him dearly. He was very loved. 